was uh, at a conference or some kind of meeting recently, and people were talking about the uneven effects of climate change uh-huh. on the planet. And uh, the person was saying they were particularly worried about Nigeria and Brazil, but mostly about Nigeria, because what's going on in the South Atlantic in terms of climate change is up to this point, alarming and also not well understood. And we have Nigeria that's going to be the most populous country. Well, well, not the most populous country, but the fastest growing country in terms of population. And their agriculture is likely going to be messed up. Do you mean fastest growing in the world or in Africa? No, in the world. I think Africa will lead the world in population growth for the next 20 to 30, whatever little population growth will be occurring, will be occurring in sub-Saharan Africa and then in South Asia. That's my understanding. But the, um, uh, so I I just sort of wandered down that rabbit hole for a while because I, you know, the first time I'd heard about this aggravated uh, climate change effects. And I discovered that the, you know, most it's interesting of, that you were thinking about this. Well, I'm, I was thinking about it because someone mentioned it, and then I, I just became interested in it to to learn more. No, right. But the reason I, sorry to interrupt, yeah, but I ahead. was just kind of surprised because we didn't talk about this as a topic before we started recording. And I, before I got on the phone with you, about five minutes before I got on the phone with you, I was watering this plant. Uh-huh. Um, and I was thinking, um, you know, people are complaining or worried or concerned. And that, it makes sense about the uh, immigrant situation mm-hmm. in the United mm-hmm. States. It makes sense because we don't know how to do any, how to, how to deal with all these people mm-hmm. and how to manage mm-hmm. it, of course. But what is the origin of it? And I was thinking, we never talk about the origin of it, or I don't talk about the origin of it being climate change. Well, and there has been a lot of climate change in Central America. Our climate change has had many effects in Central America, which I understand is driving some of that uh, immigration into the U.S. So the reason why we're talking about it is I was going to tell you this without recording it. And then you said, let's start recording it right now. And I said, "Okay." And so we're having this is like a a prelude to our conversation. But I I think it'll be interesting. So I, I started researching this. And basically, most of the research, scientific work done about climate change and the oceans is being done about the North Atlantic, because Mm -hmm. that's where the rich countries are who have the money to do it. And the South Atlantic is under research because almost all the countries, well, in fact, all the countries that border on the South Atlantic are poor best middle income brazil i'm sure is is the richest and then uh, nigeria probably is in there and when these governments have to choose between uh social welfare or education programs and then o- o- oceanic research they obviously uh you can't fault them for the choice that they make so i have a friend who lives in california uh, in Santa Cruz, Jack, uh, who just got his PhD in marine biology and is working uh, at the University of Santa Cruz on some kind of uh, research grant. So he's my expert on all things watery and climate change related. So I reached out to him and I said, did you know about this? We talked for a while and I said, would you would you come on Pandas playing cello so we could chat about this issue someday? And he said he'd love to. So cool. that's what I wanted to tell you <laughs> about <laughs> upcoming attractions. And I thought <laughs> I thought this would be a very, very cool thing. Yeah, great. And uh, again, one of the things I hate about arguing, so I don't like to argue. And one of the things I hate about arguing is that you you tend to lose all nuance and subtlety and depth when you argue and the uh the, well, the you fact, don't learn anything yeah of course and the fact that climate change is uh 
is so complex and its yeah. effects are so varied is is lost on a lot of people, both people who really worry about climate change and and then those who deny it. They you know they they're both in uh, uh, sometimes ignore certain subtleties or whatever. Do you think we could have him on at the same time as we have? I, mean, I don't know if we want to continue to have this this as part of the prelude, but just in our conversation, do you think we could have him on at the same time as we have? As my friend uh, Melody, who um, is an atmospheric scientist, who oh, that would be awesome. climate change. I'm, yes, I, I I can't imagine that that would be a problem. Yeah, I think that they would jibe. I, and um, okay, I'll ask her if she's up yeah, for it. Yeah, yeah. So I don't think we're talking before December sometime, but yeah, but uh, that would that would be awesome. I wanted yeah. to say one more thing about arguing, and then yeah. we can get on to our main course. Excellent. Uh, or not, Appetizer. or not, or not. But uh, when I was talking about how I don't like to argue, uh, the irony struck me because I started my, well, the highlight of my academic life, both in high school and in college was I was a college debater. And I argued, I argued for a living and uh, literally, because I got a full tuition scholarship and I spent, uh, a lot of time, um, uh, and, and so that spilled over into my private life, and I was argumentative and, you know, thought I was really smart and was always ready to correct people and, and would uh, be quite critical of people who I didn't think were particularly intellectual or thoughtful or whatever. And something happened that kind of just washed that totally, not totally, but largely out of my system. So that for many years, I, I I like I would be taking a class and I would be the person in the back of the room who never raised her hand or said anything because mm -hmm. I, I was just, I was correcting, uh, you know, probably overcorrecting for what I had been. But what was I, the transitional moment? I mean, this sounds, uh, the transitional yeah, moment so was when I had a, a, a small, uh, you know, I'm a sophomore in college. So, you know, it's it's all that stuff that happens when you're young. Uh, and I had had uh, a uh, climactic event occur at Texas Tech, which I'm purposefully being vague about, but it's it's not anything. It's it's something that happens to many people, to almost all of us. And uh, so I dropped out of school. And so I was in my dorm, Stangle, Stangle Hall at Texas Tech. And, you know, all the women who lived near me knew that I was leaving maybe even that night. And so they formed a little conga line to say goodbye, basically. And I remember this one woman. And while the crisis had been building up, I had, um, um, I had, had, you know, people knew that I was, you know, unhappy or whatever. And, uh, you know, I started confiding in people and, and like having a more normal relationship with some of the women in the dorm. So when in this conga line, this one person said to me, Carmen, I thought you were an asshole. But in the last few days, I've grown to like you a little bit. And I went, oh, well, thank you. But that that comment really stuck in my mind and always, you know, I don't I don't think I verbalized it this way, but I, I I certainly have acted subsequently that I never want anyone to ever say that about me again, that I, I, I don't want that kind of uh, reaction to me. So that was then that, and I, and it just completely diverted my path. And it's so interesting about memory because. Did you not drop out? I did. I did drop out. Yeah. So I, I dropped out for so a semester. Wow. So you did drop out. Yeah. Yeah. Which is great. It's one of my, I mean, I don't put it in my bio, but it, it was always really good to have that. I felt like it just. Um, Why don't we put that stuff in our bios? I, I dropped out for know. a semester too. I mean, I just took time off and I could yeah. do it because of credits and stuff, but we should talk about that. <laughs> we should, we should, I mean, are you open to talking about that? Cause there's this assumption. Yeah, sure. that like, We can talk about, I mean, really, I, I like yeah. this idea of, of of just talking. I mean, I, I've told you this before. I bore people with this. When people ask me what my management philosophy was or is, 
I would say conversation. Conversation is is like the source of all goodness. Right. And actually, we should talk about that because when you wrote that in that LinkedIn post, I was like, oh, does Carmen see our relationship as a management relationship? And I wondered about that. Oh, no. I, no. All right. I know. No. I know that you didn't. But then I thought that you, you were making the link between um, management and conversation, which yes. is rarely, right. rarely made. Right. Yeah. OK, good. So just checking that out. But yeah, sort of checking that out. And then the other thing is this piece where we have this idea that um, a person who's really good at what they're doing or that you want to hire for a job or that you think will do well in life or be successful is a person whose sort of resume looks like this. Mm, yes, right. Like there are no chinks in the armor, mm -hmm. always continually succeeding. There's no mm -hmm. moments of like thought or, you know, taking a break to reflect on anything. Now, of course, the data suggests that the way people learn best is by doing this. Right. I mean, like I learned something. Oh, then I failed. Oh, wow. That really helped me learn here. I changed and I, I, I failed at that, but I actually succeeded this other thing. That I didn't know what I was doing. And, and so, so once again, we have this, this disconnect between what we know scientifically about the human mind and, and human development and learning in adulthood and what the expectation is. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is that difference this difference between sort of the developmental awareness and the awareness of the need to rest and, and the actual learning process so let's put that over here that difference between that and this expectation which no one actually for zero people fulfill mm -hmm. and you're lying if you think you fulfill it or you're totally unself aware <laughs> right i'll we'll put that over here that difference causes so much strife and so much um bad hiring and so much lack of retention of good people and mm. so much um, damage to kids as they're growing up that I wonder if we could talk about that, like how to, how to, how to, sh I mean, first of all, do you agree with that? And second, if so, how to reframe the culture? I mean, is yeah. that the patriarchy? Oh, is that the patriarchy? Well, or is that I, something else? I agree with you. Uh, Two, I think uh, there's a huge bias mindset, particularly in West European cultures, in favor of the word I use is smoothness. You want things to be smooth, straight. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't want them to be crunchy. And so when I talk about being a change agent, I often say that change agents need to remember that organizations value smoothness. And so they have to, uh, I don't know, kind of trick the organization or behave in such a way that, that they seem not quite so disruptive because uh, organi you know, organizations don't like disruption. We all know that. But the reason why they don't like disruption is that we all like things to be smooth. And and yeah, this linear, this idea that uh, you're making me think about how I might rewrite my official bio, actually, to talk. Uh oh, okay, tell and, me more. Well, to talk about the, the moments of failure that were, I thought, that I'm uh, most proud of or that had, a, you know, the, that were most meaningful to me so uh, i've often when i well when let's I'm... do that now okay and then i'll rewrite my bio now like let's let's talk about what our bios would be like if we did that right well are you okay with that yeah absolutely so what if i so uh i talk about well right, let's read <laughs> let's read your existing bio okay i need to find it so that's going to be a little little okay. crunchy here uh oh see uh oh what? But this is nice. This is a, that's crunchy. Exactly. This, it's this a, is a, moment, crunchy, a right. moment of reality. And, and in fact, I think about that when I'm looking at our videos and editing them. And I, you know, you know, you can spend 10 minutes to try to get that last syllable that shouldn't be part of the of the stream at that moment out of there. 
And uh, I'm like going, no, I'm just going to leave it in because, I'm, you know, it's real. Why, why shouldn't we leave it in? Well, also, it gives the audience a chance to rest from the, I mean, exactly. you know, the intensity so, of the conversation. So anyway, let's leave all this in. I, I'm going to, I'm going to be hunting around here. I think the best thing to do would be to find it in my email because I think, you know, I'm... writing bios, like I've gone to uh, ChatGPT to write my bio. Oh, have you? Yeah. And I just asked it, um, hey, write a bio for Julia Mossbridge. Oh. And um, it comes up with some like, incredibly grandiose stuff oh. that it totally hallucinated um, about me. And, mm -hmm. and to me, that speaks exactly to this, like, ooh, bios are supposed to make you sound amazing and like you yes. never fail right. and you're always right. on top of the world. And yes. it's like if there's a graph of your life where you're going up and down, bios are just supposed to just supposed to show right on top of this line yes so let me nothing beneath the surface exactly oh my god i don't know how we hit upon this topic but it's <laughs> it's huge because it is huge it is it's just huge okay so it, it says carmen a retired senior federal executive with 32 years experience in the intelligence community oh this is boring for me to read this is a recognized yeah, national keep going. international expert on intelligence analysis strategic thinking diversity of thought, and innovation and intrapreneurs in the public sector. I'm the co-author of Rebels at Work, and my story as a change agent is featured in Wharton School Professor Adam Grant's bestseller, Originals, How Nonconformists Move the World. So, uh, so the only time you looked at me was when you said Originals. Oh. So I think that's the one you're most passionate about. Well, uh I also was looking at you as I wasn't sure if I ever mentioned that to you, that that I'm in that book. Uh, you never mentioned it to me, but I saw it in your bio and I think it's really mm, cool. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, yeah. OK. But one of the anyway. things that uh, so I have another bio of, uh, that I've that I've used uh, of the what, uh, the not so serious bio. Yeah. That I don't know if I can pull it up because I'm on a different computer. But the first sentence is Carmen is a retired senior uh, retired federal person whose only real talent is noticing things that might be important or not earlier than some other people do. I mean, like it's, that's yeah. actually like the first sentence. Yeah. Yeah. And I had um, uh, somebody who actually read from the bio and asked me, are you sure you, and I go, yes. So that, that was fun. Uh, but this bio is, you know, for some official, they're going to put it on a on a website. So I had to, you know, do the. the but do you? The I mean, so. I, yeah, but do, do well, like, we, this is how we perpetuate it. This is way. This oh, is well, that's the way is, it should be. This, this is, is how, how we're going to we perpetuate it. Right. This is like yeah. Jacob Ward's uh, The Loop. Right. right? This right. is how we create the sameness. Yeah. And decide what the status quo is so okay let's write this new bio you're, okay. you're right but see what i would what i would wow what would i say in my bio you know um carmen notices things before they happen here's how she got there oh i like that that's a good start yeah notices things okay let's get going. early on uh well i mean uh she had a very uh turbulent uh well, turbulence is a little strong, but she had a, you know, I had a, I, I never lived more than uh, like two years in one place until I was 12 when, when the family moved to El Paso and, uh, and I had a pretty exciting, um, uh, personal family life because my father and my mother, you know, were constantly fighting and my father drank too much. And, and I, and I do often use this a turbulent childhood story as a lead in or the first story I tell when I talk about being a change agent in government. So I do talk about that. Yeah, I keep going. Oh, and then, um, you know, she was a good what student. Did, yeah. What did you learn from that? Your parent, your father being abusive. Well, what uh, I now drinking. after the uh, after I didn't know I was learning this at the time, but I believe that I I I sort of honed my emotional intelligence skills. 
that I became very sensitive to detecting a person's mood from their body language or how they walked into the house. And I've actually had this guy, Steve Blank, who's an entrepreneur, does lean agile stuff, uh, actually say to me that his theory is that entrepreneurs that he's interviewed have usually uh, rugged childhoods and that he thinks that actually helps them become better uh, entrepreneurs precisely because of the emotional intelligence that is developed. So interesting theory. And uh, I don't want this all to be about me writing a bio. So we're going to have to. Why not? This. this is such, uh, this is so instructive. We could switch over. All right. But like, it's, it's so instructive to talk about this if you're willing. Yeah, I'll keep going. Uh, so wait a minute. Do you want me to read what I have so far? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, karma notices things before they happen. Here's how she got there. She never lived more than two years in one place until she was 12 when the family moved from, to El Paso from Puerto Rico. No, Jeez, that that's right? not right. You put that in there, but that's I not did. Right. That's yeah. why I thought I'd ask. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm to an El army Paso. brat. So we actually moved to El Paso from Germany via San Francisco, but that that's all, that's way, all right. way more cumbersome than you all need All right, so be. I'll say an army brat. She never moved yeah. for, for more right. than two years to when the family moved to El Paso. Yeah. She had an exciting personal family life because her parents were fighting and her father drank too much and was abusive. She honed her emotional intelligence skills as a result, becoming very sensitive to people's movements and how they carried themselves to detect energy before anyone <laughs> arrived. That's true. That's a good, uh, that's, 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 yeah, that's good. Okay. So, uh, yeah. She dropped so, out of. No, I think what no? I would put in there in the eighth grade, her eighth, an eighth grade teacher told her uh, that uh, when she went to high school, that she should take speech classes because Carmen, a native Spanish speaker, the teacher said, Carmen, you speak too fast and too loud and taking speech will help you with that. So I had an interesting uh, session where I told that little bit to some group of people, I forget who again. And they said, uh, and I asked whether or not in today's environment, a teacher would feel like that was an okay thing to say to a student. And um, so, you know, we had a, some people thought the teacher could still do it. Other people weren't sure, you know, but for well, me, what was your reaction? My reaction was, thank you. And then I took speech class when I went to high school. And it's not like this was a particularly favorite teacher of mine. It's not like I, we had a great, I mean, we had a fine relationship, but, you know, she wasn't a favorite. And, um, right. uh, but I, I guess I recognized that her advice was well-intentioned. And so when I took speech, that's when I realized I had this talent for, uh, speaking in public or argumentation or whatever it is. And that's kind of how, how I defined, or, or you know, that, that was sort of the thread that went through my high school and college, uh, time okay so hey you know you're writing this by default in third person isn't yeah. that interesting that we also feel like that's better well that's how someone... yeah that's how they oh, that's how it's done yeah. right why yeah, is that how, how it's, it's... i don't know why it's done that way it's oh you're you're frozen just for a second carmen notices things before they happen here's how she got there oh i like that that's a good start yeah notices things okay let's get going. early on uh, well, I mean, uh, she had a very, uh, turbulent, uh, well, turbulent is a little strong, but she had a, you know, I had a, I, I never lived more than uh, like two years in one place until I was 12 when, when the family moved to El Paso and, uh, and I had a pretty exciting, um, uh, personal family life because my father and my mother, you know, were constantly fighting and my father drank too much. And, and I, and I do often use this a turbulent childhood story as a lead in or the first story I tell when I talk about being a change agent in government. So I do talk about that. Yeah, I keep going. Oh, and then, um, you know, she was a good what student. Did, yeah. What did you learn from that? 
your parent your father being abusive well what uh, i now drinking. after the uh, after i didn't know i was learning this at the time but i believe that i i i sort of honed my emotional intelligence skills that i became very sensitive to detecting a person's mood from their body language or how they walked into the house and I've actually had this guy, Steve Blank, who's an entrepreneur, does lean agile stuff, uh, actually say to me that his theory is that entrepreneurs that he's interviewed have usually uh, rugged childhoods and that he thinks that actually helps them become better uh, entrepreneurs precisely because of the emotional intelligence that is developed. So interesting theory. And uh, I don't want this all to be about me writing a bio, so we're going to have to- Why not? This. this is such, uh, this is so instructive. We could switch over. All right. But like, it's it's so instructive to talk about this, if you're willing. Yeah, I'll keep going. Uh, so Wait a minute. Do you want me to read what I have so far? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Karma notices things before they happen. Here's how she got there. She never lived more than two years in one place until she was 12 when the family moved from, to El Paso from Puerto Rico. No, Jeez, that's right? not right. You put that in there, but that's I not did. Right. That's yeah. why I thought I'd ask. Yeah. 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 I'm an army brat. So we actually moved to El Paso from Germany via San Francisco, but that that's all, that's way, all right. way more cumbersome than you. All need right. So I'll be. say an army brat. She never moved yeah. for, for right. more than two years to when the family moved to El Paso. Yeah. She had an exciting personal family life because her parents were fighting and her father drank too much and was abusive. She honed her emotional intelligence skills as a result, becoming very sensitive to people's movements and how they carried themselves to detect energy before anyone arrived. That's true. That's a good, uh, that's, that's, yeah, that's good. Okay. So, uh, yeah. She dropped so, out of. No, I think what no. I would put in there in the eighth grade, her eighth, an eighth grade teacher told her uh, that uh, when she went to high school, that she should take speech classes because Carmen, a native Spanish speaker, the teacher said, Carmen, you speak too fast and too loud and taking speech will help you with that. So I had an interesting uh, session where I told that little bit to some group of people, I forget who again. And they said, uh, and I asked whether or not in today's environment, a teacher would feel like that was an okay thing to say to a student. And um, so, you know, we had a, some people thought the teacher could still do it. Other people weren't sure, you know, but for well, me, what was your reaction? My reaction was, thank you. And then I took speech class when I went to high school. And it's not like this was a particularly favorite teacher of mine. It's not like I, we had a great, I mean, we had a fine relationship, but, you know, she wasn't a favorite. And, um, right. uh, but I, I guess I recognized that her advice was well-intentioned. And so when I took speech, that's when I realized I had this talent for uh, speaking in public or argumentation or whatever it is. And that's kind of how, how I defined, or, or you know, that, that was sort of the thread that went through my high school and college uh, time. Okay, so hey, you know, you're writing this by default in third person. Isn't yeah. that interesting that we also feel like that's better? Well, that's how, someone... yeah, that's how they oh, that's how it's done, yeah. right? Yeah, why is that how, how it's, it's I don't know why it's done that way. It's oh, you're you're frozen just for a second. Oh, Julia, you're frozen. I think you're frozen as opposed to me being frozen. Let's see. It looks to me like my uh, internet is pretty brisk here. Oh, you're coming back. You're coming back. Okay. I lost you too. Okay. So yeah, it, it's, in, it's in third person. I get that that's how it's done. But when you talk about it, you, you sometimes say I, and then we have to switch. And yeah, because sometimes I'll so just start telling it like me, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And what, it, what if it is I like, do we do we believe really when we read someone's bio that says she or he that it wasn't written by the person? Like we know that it was written by the person, <laughs> but it's supposed to be more. It was supposed to be more objective. <laughs> I, it's what a nuttiness, right? Yeah, <laughs> yes, the nuttiness. 
Okay, so <laughs> okay, so let's do a little bit of your bio, and then and then we can. Uh... Okay, that, we're not going to do the whole thing then. Okay. Yeah, I guess, no, I because... just think that would it would just take too long. But I like that. I like that story of putting the story in there. Of you know, someone actually gave you this feedback, which sounds a little bit critical, and this wasn't a person that you. Right, right. I mean, it's the, it's the of. kind of feedback that might trigger someone in today's language. But I yeah. was like, oh, I didn't know that. I really, that's the first person who ever said that. And I was like, okay, I, I, I'm going to work on that. Well, right. And often things that trigger you are things that you actually kind of later reflect on and go, oh, well, yeah, <laughs> like someone, exactly. someone said that they thought you were an asshole. Yes, yes, yes. And I mean, I probably, I mean, dropped the probably i know i was acting like an asshole but yeah right you know one of the things i've always thought would be a great thing in in the stupid performance reviews that organizations do god there's nothing more broken than that would be but you know usually you have to write to some questions and i would like i always wanted a question to be uh tell me about the failure yeah, you made last year that that you're most proud of, or that you learned the most from, or whatever. However, you formulate that. Yeah, yeah. Those are the performance reviews. It's like a, it's an essay contest. Yes, which which I will always win. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> no, like people people like me who can write will always win because mm-hmm. I'm just going to shape mm-hmm. whatever happened into what I know that they want to yes. hear. Yes, but is that are, are they measure are, are performance reviews just to measure your capacity to convince people of things in writing? I know. Because I know I mean- exactly right. I did that in college, by the way. I was taking a philosophy midterm, probably, and I I loved philosophy. I had no problem studying it or retaining it. It was naturally interesting to me. But there were two essay questions, and let's say each one had five points. So on one of them. I remembered four points, but I just kind of glossed it over somehow with my writing. And then another essay question, I actually said, there are five points to this answer, but I can only remember four. Here they are. I just did it that way. (laughs) So the first question I got full credit for and the second question, you know, whatever, 10 points were taken off. And I just laughed to myself. I just thought, how silly. Yeah, yeah, that's the insanity. Okay, wait a minute. Just before we go to do the do the bio yeah. about performance reviews, one other thing is the reason why. See, the reason why we do all these things, like writing a bio in third person, mm. and doing these performance reviews as if they aren't going to tell us anything other than what we already know about mm-hmm. Work, mm-hmm. working with a person, is because we have a belief in objectivity. Mm-hmm. And it's it's so false, right? It's this idea that um, by writing in the third person that all of a sudden it will appear like an objective description of someone mm-hmm, mm-hmm. or by someone ta- giving facts about the number of times they held a meeting or yes. succeeded or fulfilled some requirement on time, that that is going to tell them that's going to be more information than what we know subjectively. Right. And so it's this, it's the, it's the putting as primary the outside. Yes. And 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 decrementing the power of the inside of what we know mm-hmm. when in fact we all operate from the inside yes and we're just looking for excuses to justify yes. what we already want to do yes on the inside right so this is back to this role of system two the logical yes. rational system yes. as a rationalizer right. of what it's already being told by system one but it won't admit that it's being told by system one and mm-hmm. it thinks it's creating a whole called cloth okay mm-hmm. So I just have to say, no, I, I, I just is so, this is so significant and really the only real way forward in creating a better society and a better planet. I honestly believe this is for us to just grapple with these issues and speak about them honestly. Yeah, uh, right. Right. Like like after some horrible tragedy happens and you say, well, God, of course, everyone's in grief. And of course, we don't know what to do. And, you know, fuck. Yes. And mean, we all, right. Just... And we all pretend that somehow the person who 
uh, can ride above all this and retain their cool is the very best person. But they're they're usually the person that commits atrocities or makes bad decisions. Uh, or they could just be mundanely not the greatest. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> they, don't, they don't even have to be like really good at being bad. Right, right. They By the way, be, I, I've been meaning yeah. to tell you this. I'll probably derail the conversation at this point, but That's sitting cool. in that or using that ottoman as the backdrop kind of gives it a Game of Thrones effect, which is it does uh, look like a throne. <laughs> which, and then I've got know. the I've got the rocks over here. Yes, like, it's all it's all very pleasant. Yes, let me speak from my throne. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I once got. I was at. I did a one of my few times I was ever on TV. I did a video shoot at a house of a person in LA um, because it was visually interesting and they're always looking for visually interesting backdrops, right? But she was the set designer for Game of Thrones and she had oh. she had the actual Game of Thrones. She actually had the throne, and yes. uh, like a, a throne from the set that they didn't oh, need anymore. Yeah. Nice. So I sat in the throne. So I can send you a picture of me on the Game of Thrones thrones. Now- <laughs> Game of Thrones throne. Uh, here we go. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh send in another curveball here. So I saw once a clip of you on a PBS show that I, I liked uh, and tried to catch as many episodes as I could of, which was called Closer to, Closer Truth. to Truth. Yeah. And you were talking about uh, consciousness. Yeah. And, you know, theories of consciousness. And uh, I don't have anything more to say about that other than that. I, I did. I don't know if you did it more than once, but I, I did catch one clip. Yeah, I had a I did a bunch of clips like way back in 2013 or something, mm -hmm. and then they started releasing them on YouTube, like three years ago. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, and, and people were like, "Oh, wow, you look so different and everything," and I'm like, "Yeah, because like, <laughs> it was a hundred million years ago." Yeah. So, um, yeah, so yeah, but I uh, yeah, that was I loved that. I enjoyed but, okay, that, that show very much, but. Uh... Yeah, no, it's a wonderful yeah. show with a lot of different interesting ideas. Yes. Um, but actually, that's not a curveball. That leads straight into my bio. Okay, so I'm going to read you my bio. Oh, yeah, boring... it does. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I'm going to read you my read you my boring bio, mm -hmm. which is somewhat interesting. Okay, Dr. Mossbridge Should is we, after... Should uh, we attach? Can we, can we do links? Oh, well, if your bio is online, we can put links to the Actually, bio. the most in... recent one isn't, but okay. we can... I could stick it online and my what doesn't that matter. Doesn't matter. We're gonna change it anyway. Okay. This is the crappy bio. Okay. I, I don't want to link to it. I okay. love this idea. I am gonna rewrite my bio. Me uh, too. And I have, you know, the funny, the not so serious bio that I can use uh, uh and then just kind of keep building that way. Yeah. I to me this comes back to this idea. It's a feminist idea that the personal is political. It's this idea yes. of what is true for you is right. actually true in the world yes. it's not just true only inside yourself mm -hmm. okay so dr mossbridge is after a deep understanding of love time and how these two human experiences relate to corresponding physical forces now i like okay. that because I it's about it's not about your status which mine is kind of about my status yeah and it's about my purpose it's about your purpose which is way better yeah so i love that first sentence yeah it goes straight into status after that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it goes straight to, she is an affiliate professor in the Department of Biophysics and Physics at the University of San Diego, senior consultant with Tangible IQ, co-founder of TILT, the Institute for Love and Time, founder of Mossbridge Institute and author, co-author of multiple books and scientific articles related to time travel, artificial intelligence, and unconditional love. Her PhD is in communication sciences and disorders to Northwestern University. Her MA is in neuroscience, UC San Francisco, and she was awarded her BA in neuroscience with highest honors over in college mm. so the rest of it is boring so i i mean that stuff okay, so i kind of feel i would i mean after that first sentence yeah let's let's just go say? yeah what would you so say? let's go back to the first sentence dr mossbridge is after a deep understanding of love time and how these two human experiences relate to corresponding physical forces okay i'm gonna just say i because i can't translate yeah I know, yeah. yeah yeah i discovered that this was my purpose after many experiences of not doing this <laughs> of of like of not pursuing this of not pursuing these questions not pursuing it yes and these included 
trying to pretend that I could support um, agendas that were focused on the scientific and technical aspects of human thinking based on an old paradigm. Mm. This, so, you know, specifically um, being kicked out of various academic circles in a friendly way, <laughs> as academics always are, <laughs> but in a very clear way, because I dared to pursue right the questions that were not allowed to be asked yes and now i'm focused on understanding how both this kind of taboo or cultural of or cultural cultural norms influence how we shape the world yes. and the decisions we right. make and how to shift that towards the truth of what human beings can be and who we are. Yes. Well, I like that a lot. And, and two comments. Uh, Did you write that down? I, I tried to. Do you want me to read it back? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, she came to this, she discovered this purpose after many experiences of not pursuing it. These included pretending... Uh, that you were supporting agendas, uh, studying, focused on scientific and technological aspects of human thinking based on an old paradigm, and then being kicked out of academic circles in a friendly but clear way for, uh, uh, and I wrote down questions not asked. So we can always go back and look at the exact wording on the video, but Yep. And then, uh, so, and you were uh, focused, you you became focused on understanding the taboo and cultural norms that influence how we shape the world uh, so that we can uh, better head toward the truth of who we can be. That's what I wrote down. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay. I'd love yeah. you to send me. I'll send you what I wrote. Yeah, yeah. I'll yours. take a picture of it. And I think you can make my writing. Uh, yeah, yeah. As, uh, I, I really like that. I, I just, um, that's more of a story of of like a human developmental story. Yes. Right. Kind of like, look where I got and there's no right. roots and there's right. no trunk. You just yes. have the, the leaves yes. on the tree. Right. Well, and, yeah. and I feel t uh, two things, or at least one that I can remember, uh, this interest in asking the questions that are not asked is something that I think we have in common. That's yeah. an or area of overlap for us. Yeah. In, in, yeah. That's why we're doing this. That's in, the show. Yes, in both of our professional careers, we were always interested in that. And um, there was something else toward the end that resonated in a particular way with me, but now of course I cannot recall it. Well, I will rewrite it and send yeah. it to you. And I, you know what? This is a game you that know, this um, is something we should ask everyone. That's what I'm thinking. Uh, who's listening, or you know, we'll find a way to accept this on excerpt this on LinkedIn. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I've, I've met a lot of people. I had a, a a reunion dinner with some former Deloitte people last week, and and many of them had listened to the two or three minute excerpts on LinkedIn, but had not really ever come back to hear the whole 40 minute discussion, which just oh, makes wow. me think how important those excerpts are. And yeah, yeah. And some of them, some of our, I would say most of our conversations generate several of those excerpts. Uh, but then, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, we should I'm, ask people to, to take the first, I mean, this is such a great exercise in so the, many ways. I can think this of- This is the pandas pe playing cello bio challenge. Yeah, this is our the bio challenge, you know, to take the first paragraph of your bio and rewrite it along the lines yeah. of what we just demonstrated. Yeah, and it works well in pairs. I think yes. one person could just speak and the other person yes. can, can no. write. I think it's harder without a pair. 
find you know, a pair. I agree. It would be yeah. almost impossible to do it without a pair. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Cool. That was, that was fantastic. I loved I love <laughs> that. And I think we're already close to Yeah, it's yeah, time for 40, dancing. 40 minutes. So you uh need to uh tell me what song we're gonna should dance to. I'll pause the video and then uh and then we'll do I, that. I think um Odetta hit or miss. It's already on our playlist. It's in fact the first song on our pandas playing cello playlist. Okay. It's perfect for this rewriting bio. All right. I'm going to mute. <laughs> 